Hey everybody, this is your Digital Super Saiyan 3 back here with another video and welcome to the month of September for my September pay-per-view review. For the month of De for the month of September, for the month of September I chose to do WWF in your house mind games. Took place September 22nd, 1990 September 22nd in 1990 in the year 1996 from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's right, we're in ECW country, baby. And speaking of some EC and speaking of ECW, some of the ECW superstars or sup or ECW wrestlers are in attendance for this show. So the commentary team consists of Jim Ross, oh, consists of J, good old JR, Jim Ross, the late great Mr. Perfect, aka Kurt Henning, and Vince McMahon himself. So, yes, so this is an oddball team threesome here. We got Vince McMahon, Jim Ross, and Mr. Perfect all doing commentary for this show. So. We get things started with our first match. Our opening contest is a Caribbean strap match. As Savio Vega defeats Justin Hawk Bradshaw in a Caribbean strap match. So both men are tied to each other. This is no disqualifications, no countouts. The only way to win this match is by touching all four turnbuckle pads that are across the ring. Um, we do see some of the ECW alumni get involved. Like, we got the Sandman, Tommy Dreamer, and Taz, I believe, are all at ringside. Um, I believe there was this part where Sandman spat beer, uh, at Savio Vega. Um, yeah, but anyway, the match wasn't terrible. It was not a bad match per se, but I really don't like the whole idea of touching turn buckle pads to win the match. Yeah, can you believe that John Bradshaw Layfield, who would years later become WWE Champion, would, would be in an opening match like this, and he would lose to Savio Vega? Yeah, can you believe that? Because I certainly can't. I mean, I know this was long before the JBL character and Justin Hawk Bradshaw was the first uh, persona that, or the first gimmick that uh, Bradshaw was doing. But yeah. So like I said, I really wasn't a big fan of the whole touching the turnbuckle pads. But, you know, they used the, the strap. They used the strap a lot, so I ain't complaining much. Okay, next up we were going into our second match, which is a match between Jose Lothario. Jose Lothario. As he, yes, Jose Lothario, the trainer of Shawn Michaels, taking on Jim Cornette. The yes, that Jim Cornette, that James E. Cornette. As Jim Cornette takes on uh Jose Lothario. Um so, Cornette comes out first, and he comes out to Vader's theme song. So, yes, it makes sense that, you know, yes, he's coming out to Vader's music because he train or because he, uh, manages Vader and the rest of Camp Cornette. And right before Jose Lothario can make his entrance, we cut to the backstage area, and you're, we're watching Savio Vega being jumped being jumped by the fake Diesel and fake Razor Ramon. Yes, as this was part of the whole Jim Ross turning heel thing and him saying that he's going to bring back Diesel and Razor Ramon, but that wasn't really the real Diesel and that's not the real Razor Ramon because we all know Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, the actual Diesel and Razor Ramon, were in WCW. So, yes, this was... 
fake Diesel and fake Razor that was jumping Savio. That was jumping Savio Vega backstage. So, now we cut to the ring and Jim Cornette is cutting a promo. He's calling Jose Lothario old. Um, he calls him a washed out wrestler. He remarks about how Lothario was great in his glory days, but saying that he's a washed up has been. Then out comes Jose Lothario. And he's coming out to Shawn Michaels' music. I mean, it's funny watching someone else come out to Shawn Michaels' music other than, well, Shawn Michaels himself. Even though we will see Shawn Michaels later on in the show because he has a WWF title match later on the later on in the show against Mankind. Um, so then we cut to... We then cut to our... Now we cut into our next match, and Jose Lothario has most... And Lothario has most of the offense on Cornette. Cornette does not even get any lick of offense in. And it was mostly a lot of clotheslines and a lot of... I don't know what else I can describe it as, but... Uh, Jose won the match, and nothing more to be said here, and then he walks off after getting a standing ovation. Yeah, this match was not great. I mean, I mean, you have a 16, you have a near 60-year-old man in Jose, or you have Jose Lothario, who is like in his early 60s, beat up a non-wrestler like James E. Cornette, like Jim Cornette, who's not even a wrestler. Why is he even wrestling on a show if he's not a wrestler? <sighs> but I digress. And so Cornette is taken backstage to... To the arenas, uh, or to the trainer's room, being tended to into the trainer's room, and Clarence Mason comes up and he's signing, and he has Cornette sign papers while Cornette was like out of it. All right, so now we get into Brian Pillman coming out as he's coming out and he's saying that you know Bret Hart is scared, you know, Bret Hart, you know, is lucky to stay away, and then he calls out Owen Hart, he asks Owen Hart to come out, and then Owen Hart comes out, and he's, like, interviewing Owen, and Owen's saying, Bret's not scared of me, and he is not scared of you, but I do realize he is scared of this man, and then out comes Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, that's right. Out comes the 1996 King of the Ring winner himself, wearing his trademark black vest with the 316 on it, and long blue jeans. And this is the moment when Steve Austin said this infamous line, If you put the letter S in front of Hitman, you have my exact opinion about Bret Hart. Yeah, that was on this show. <sighs> and yes, Bret Hart would return um in Indianap in Indianapolis in October after the night after uh in your house buried alive in which he would accept Stone Cold Steve Austin's challenge for their match at Survivor Series. <sighs> Next up we get... Now, speaking of Owen Hart, we would have him and his tag team partner, the British Bulldog, challenge the young... the young guns, Billy Gunn and Bart Gunn, for the WWF tag team titles, tag team championships, and... Yes, you have Clarence Mason in the corner of 
Owen and Bulldog, while in the corner of the Young Guns, they had Sonny. And when the Young Guns revealed Sonny's poster, Sonny sees that her poster was just graffitied on by Owen and Bulldog. So, so the match wasn't terrible. It was not a terrible match by any means. Um, I think Owen was, no, I think Bulldog was the one who got the pin. I, w I believe Bulldog was the one who scored the pinfall for him and Owen to win the tag team titles. So yeah, Owen and Bulldog beat the young, the young guns, and then Sonny then fires both Billy and Bart, saying, You both are fired! 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 And Sonny acting like a spoiled little brat. And the one thing I can say to Sonny is, Get your life together, lady. Seriously, Sonny. I cannot believe that you can't even avoid... Being getting your ass arrested several times, and now this time you're going up the river for good. Man, Sonny, you definitely were not worthy of ever becoming a WWE Hall of Famer. Let alone the fact that you couldn't keep yourself out of trouble. <sighs> so we get a so we get an interview from the from the boiler of the arena of Paul Bearer. Talking about, talking about how mankind might become the new WWF champion. And we have Vince McMahon, Mr. Perfect, and JR talking about, oh, what would the WWF be like if mankind was WWF champion? If mankind was the WWF champion. Now we get into our next match. As we have Mark Henry defeating Jerry the King Lawler. And yes, this was Mark Henry's first match. His first official match in the WWF. In the WWF. And how Jerry Lawler said he's going to give Mark Henry a wrestling lesson. And most of it was Lawler trying to overpower Mark Henry, but... Pretty much he couldn't overpower Mark Henry at all because Henry was younger, he was stronger, he was faster. And he beat Lawler with this move. I'm not sure what I can call the move that he used to pin or to that he used to beat Lawler with. But he did manage to get us that he, he did manage to score a victory over the wily veteran that was Jerry Lawler. So nothing more to be said here. But yeah. What was it? What was up with Jerry Lawler even wrestling in the WWF past his peak, man? The guy was, like, past his peak. And that's just sad. So, next up, we have the most unusual match in, in the WWF history... We have The Undertaker defeating Goldust. That's right. So Goldust has had victories over The Undertaker. Mostly due in part to Mankind being a factor involved with Goldust defeating The Undertaker. He was the reason why Goldust beat The Undertaker at In Your House Beware of Dog. As well as their match at In Your House International Incident. Or I believe it was International Incident. They had a... No, wait. Not Beware of Dog. Uh, international Incident. Yeah. So, yeah. Goldust had won a casket match against The Undertaker, thanks in part to Mankind. It, and, of course, we want to know, is there an alliance between Mankind, Paul Bearer, and Goldust? And we get our answer here when The Undertaker defeats Goldust... Just like that. But it was a solid match nonetheless. Um, Marlena still tried to do some of her heelish tactics to help Goldust win. But in the end... But in the end, Dust, old Dustin Rhodes ate a tombstone for his... Ate a tombstone pile driver for his pleasure. 
So The Undertaker won the match. Of course he would win the match. But it was not a bad match by any means. It was a very okay match. <sighs> and now, here we go. It is for the WWF Championship. As Shawn Michaels, the WWF Champion, Shawn Michaels, the Heartbreak Kid, defends against Mankind with Paul Bearer. And yes, Shawn Michaels has Jose Lothario. And now, this match was the match of the night, and every time I watch a list of best WWF matches in 1996, this match, often or not, tops that list. And it's not hard to see why. This match was... This match is what definitely gave way to the types of main events we would see years later in the Attitude Era, as, as we would see how this would be the first time we would see uh, a main event that definitely would be the pilot for Attitude Era-esque main events. And this was a perfect match to round out the show. So, Michaels wins the match via disqualification after... A run-in by Vader. So after a run-in by Vader, despite despite how wild and crazy this match was, like especially that table spot and the top rope sweet chin music, where Shawn Michaels did like this jumping sweet chin music and hits Mankind with it. Um, right as Vader and Mankind are double teaming on Shawn, out comes Sid Vicious. He's brawling with Vader. Paul Bearer and Mankind are attacking Sean, and they're attempting to put Sean in a casket that Paul Bearer and Mankind had brought out to ringside. Well, technically, Mankind was already in the casket. And right as they were going to put Sean in the casket, out comes The Undertaker, who pops out of the casket, and he starts brawling with Mankind. And yes, I... I forgot to mention, they even talked about the In Your House Buried Alive show that would that would come this October with the Buried Alive match. That would happen between Sean, or that would happen between Mankind and The Undertaker. Why was I about to see, Sh why was I about to see Shawn Michaels? Because Shawn Michaels did not wrestle on Buried Alive. But yeah, so, that was In Your House Mind Games. Final thoughts, I don't know if I call it a good show or a bad show. I just call it a meh kind of show. I just think it's just a show. But, you know, it wasn't all that bad. Yes, there was some bad stuff on it, and there was some decent stuff on it, and a damn good main event that came out of this show. So overall, In Your House Mind Games wasn't a completely bad show. Wasn't a completely bad show. Anyway, this has been your Digital Super Saiyan 3, and I will see you guys in October for In Your House Bad Blood from 1997. See ya!